Uh, so I'm going to start by just giving a little bit of my kind of basic background, what, what brought me here. Some people know the story. I'm a bit insufferable about telling it. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about something that I've kind of developed, I guess what you can call a little bit of a, uh, an infamous <laughs> reputation for, which is taking a look at the, the Biden team coming in and, and some of the prospects, uh, good and, and, and plenty troubling, uh, and then kind of close out with an idea about what it means to be systemically opposing wars, which uh, really goes past the discrete conflicts themselves. So uh, for those who, who don't know, and some who might, uh, on paper, right, uh, I'm the following things, right? And, uh, and there are things that 17-year-old me would have really liked to hear. Uh, I went to West Point, a, a grad of the school. Uh, I spent 17 years there and in the Army as a, mainly as a commander of Cavalry Scouts, uh, I fought in both the Iraq and Afghan surges in Baghdad and Kandahar provinces, respectively. Uh, later, I taught history to freshmen at West Point. And uh, in fact, many of my students have been to or are in Afghanistan, as well as other places, right? Other, other theaters of our kind of global war. Uh, I began my vague and wildly inadequate, uh, inadequate descent on active duty because a, a certain point came, I think, where I thought it obscene not to speak in some limited way. Uh, now I'm full-time writing and, you know, peace and justice activist. Well, that's all on paper. But in real life, uh, I was once a true believer, like really one, embarrassingly so, perhaps, especially after 9-11, uh, as a New Yorker from an FDNY family, a uh, neighborhood where they named corners after dead firemen, some of whom were uh, family friends, you know, serious, close ones. Uh, so I wanted revenge too, you know, whatever that means. Uh, but I was sent to Iraq first, not Afghanistan, which had at least some tenuous ties to the attacks. Uh, and there in Iraq, uh, I fell in something like love with a lot of the Iraqi people. A lot of my soldiers didn't always agree with that. Um, they would say that, you know, LT had gone native, you know, which is, of course, one of these horrifying colonial terms that just stays with us, right? But that was the stuff that was said. But I think ultimately the madness, the hopelessness, and the horror of that war, that surge in civil war, broke my heart and probably changed my life to some extent. Um, on that first tour, I, I took part in and uh, was attacked from both sides of a, a civil war that the United States government started. Uh, four of my men died, two by suicide. Um, about half the rest were wounded. Uh, I think I, I saw like more uh, death and bodies th than I ever imagined the sights and smells of, you know, the suicide bombings that don't leave you too easily. But the thing that really changed for me was the gap between what we were told we were there to do and what we were actually doing and knowing that my own country had caused almost all of it. Uh, later, I was a company commander. Uh, had about 100 scouts and, and, and a bunch of Afghans under my command in the Afghanistan surge, four more dead, one of which was suicide. But the thing is, there was no real progress, no ability to measurably change that society or uh, real right for us to try. Uh, and, you know, after a recent uh, movie night with my 12 year old son, uh, who was, in fact, you know, conceived right after I returned from Iraq, days after uh, he asked me, why were we in Iraq? Like, it was very strange to him. He, he didn't understand. I think he saw my sort of visceral physical reaction and uh, probably uh, a, a few tears streaming. And I realized I had no answers for him. And, that, and that, still, that still shook me. I mean, no answers, of course, except the fact that he's named after three men, young men, Alexander, Fuller, James uh, Smith, and Michael Balsley, all under the age of 22 who died there, one by his own hand. And so the truth came to me that these various wars in the Middle East had been sold to us on false pretexts, and they continue on false justifications. Mostly they've been counterproductive, damaged the soul of our republic, wasted American, but, but here's the thing, way more foreign lives, and, and they all matter. Uh, and, and that's something we don't talk about enough. So one of the things is that there's a lot of talk these days in society, not so much in this sort of space, uh, vapid talk oftentimes about supporting and thanking troops and veterans. And it's become a platitude of mine, but if you really want to do that, which this president or any essentially could because of the nature of our imperial presidency, uh, could what they could do is create less of them, right? Create fewer of them, uh, fewer combat vets, fewer morally injured, fewer plagued with guilt and PTSD, of course, fewer foreign deaths at the hands directly or indirectly of our 
imperial entity. And make sure a woman or a man born after 9-11 doesn't die in wars that were begun before they were born. Now, if one does, if one of those people does die in a war that they weren't alive for the start of, which would be the first time in American history, uh, it is likely to be in a place like Afghanistan, which brings me to another pivot point, maybe a second pivot point in my life, especially philosophically in terms of uh, what it means to oppose these sorts of things. And that was uh, the Obama-Biden 2008 election, and then my follow-on second tour, second surge to Afghanistan. Uh, I was on the Obama train in 2007 and 8. I used to follow the primaries from Baghdad. Uh, and, and I put a lot of hope in, in Barack Obama, a lot. I mean, some of it was pretty cliched. Um, so, you know, I was secretly canvassing across the river from Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, in southern Indiana, like uh, on the weekends in a hoodie, you know, like not really talking about it, uh, obviously, with my uh, my chain of command, you know, in the school that I was in. Uh, I was I remember, you know, talk cliches, crying with that with that son, that then infant son on election night. Right. AJ. And, uh, and then even uh, making bl blue martinis on Inauguration Day in 2009 for like the three or four other uh, vaguely liberal officers at the school. Um, you know, but the thing is what followed was an uh, at least or more absurd surge, uh, at least or more hopeless surge in Afghanistan. And I, I realized that this, was, this was an Obama surge. This was a, a Democrat surge that really what we were dealing with here was, was a duopoly, a systemic problem, not a red team and a blue team, good versus bad situation. And, and I, couldn't, I couldn't square that, you know, that the, the salvation wasn't in fact gonna come from the top, that maybe there weren't any adults minding the store who knew better than I did, which is I think one of the delusions that I had and, and many Americans do. What followed was a sort of Obama era dormancy Again, not so much with the sorts of folks that are probably on this webinar, but across you know, the United States and even across spaces on the left, there was an Obama dormancy. And what we saw was uh, anti-Bushism masquerading as anti-war. And so I felt that the polite liberals, as I uh, have sometimes called them, abandoned any systemic critique. And maybe self-righteously, I felt that they had abandoned me and my troops. Uh, to another tour in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, Biden was a bit better on Afghanistan. Certainly not perfect, uh, but the reports are that as vice president, he was a little more circumspect. And uh, some of that's in Ambassador Holbrook's diary, but not his squad, not the bunch that he bought in, that he has so far brought in for his pick. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I'm hopeful, if not optimistic. And, uh, and it's, it's a very limited hope, I mean, frankly. Uh, I don't really believe in, in despair and the apathy that it sometimes breeds, but there's, there are areas where we could see improvement, right? We're 99 hours now to inauguration. What, what might be better? Well, uh, some small movement on Iran, perhaps, uh, getting back in that deal, if we can. It's not enough, but it's better than what we saw. On the climate, I think it would be hard to be worse than uh, the current president. And, uh, and of course, the, the current MAGA madness has been troubling on a number of levels. However, if you, and none of what follows is any sort of apologia for what was in the last administration, and certainly not what's happened now, but we also have to have some intellectual consistency, I think. And, and that is that the Biden bunch that's incoming on national security is a lot like putting the arsonists in charge of the fire brigade. Now, some people will reject that, but let's be clear what arson I'm talking about. The architects of the Iraq war, the architects of the initial Afghan war, uh, most of them aren't in this team, but some, and also the architects of the disasters in Libya and Yemen and uh, contributing to Syria, they are, as well as some other places, they are. And so what we're seeing, though, is a systemic problem that I realized when the Democrats, when Obama, when the, the person I put so much stock in sent us on that second hopeless tour. And the systemic is that the, the archetypal Biden pick has been essentially a, a war industry shill in many cases. Uh, mortgages were, uh, are, and may again be paid by, by some element 
of, of that war industry, of that military industrial complex. And I think it's important to note that, you know, whether it's uh, Jake Sullivan or Lloyd Austin or another Raytheon plant, uh, you know, Tony Blinken, Avril Haines, Victoria Newland and her connection to the Kagan family, which is a neocom brand. I mean, th these are pretty provocative picks or they should be, but I think because of what came before, uh, some of it's getting a pass, but not quite as much. And this is the whole part, not quite as much as I saw in the Obama era of dormancy. And uh, somebody just popped up on the chat said, Newland is so bad. And uh, I, I can go on and on about that. There, there's a lot of problems that I pick, but here's, here's what I'm afraid of. Uh, putting stock in, in the top, in one of the two parties, has failed before. One of the great anecdotes on this is, you know, John Kerry, for example. And so John Kerry had been uh, active to some extent in the Winter Soldier hearings after Vietnam, VVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War. But then when Iraq Veterans Against the War was formed in, you know, 2004, 2005 in their activism, when Kerry is running for president, uh, some of these folks reached out to him. And I talked to uh, Vince Emanuele, who was kind of, you know, there at the ground level. And they, they, they wanted to reach out to him as a candidate and say, hey, look, embrace us. Like we, we, we styled our name and ourselves on, on you and, or at least on the movement you were vaguely a part of. And, and he didn't want to touch them, you know, because he was afraid that they would swift boat him, right? That the Republicans would swift boat him. Of course they did anyway, they always will. Uh, but there was sort of a rejection to some extent of, uh, of the, you know, of the anti-war movement. And that was from, you know, the mainline Democratic Party. So I think that when we talk about the profound crises that we're in today, there's the immediate ones, insurrection, uh, you know, every aspect of the Trump presidency, but there's a lot of that that's serious, but also symptomatic. And it's symptomatic of what? It's the systemic. So the persistent systemic stuff is the Republic devastating and liberty squelching endless war and empire, the existential or potentially existential and in the form of climate catastrophe or a nuclear Armageddon, uh, which has been a bipartisan policy uh, and the military industrial complex, corruption, cronyism and kleptocracy that underpins and enables the whole thing, right? That underpins and enables the entire thing. So when we think about how that might affect us and how we might you know, attack these issues. I think we have to realize that clearly uh, the salvation is not coming from the top. It's not likely to be uh, pulled, right, from the leadership of either the Democrats or the Republicans or any administration, but far more likely to be a push from the bottom. And that's people, organizers, grassroots mass movements that are providing pressure which is really the only way, historically speaking, that major change happens at the top, if it even comes from there at all. Uh, because we really are not seeing a group of people here uh, that have shown any penchant for the transformational change. Uh, last point on the military industrial complex as I close out. I think that if we don't look at what underpins this thing and we fight discrete wars or we fight discrete presidents, whether it's Bush or Trump, or whomever, or Biden, then uh, we are leaving the system in place that creates it. I'm a child of the Reagan Bush fetishizing, sanitizing of the military of the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, and then of the a teenager of the Clinton years where it was sort of a cloaking and pretending that there was no militarism or war. And I remember the absurdly optimistic uh, be all you can be commercials that the army had. And they were great. They were great. I mean, of course, they were great because they didn't have like some major or captain in the Pentagon basement like me making them, you know, an amateur hour. No, they had corporate advertising agencies contracted out. And so there was something for everyone in there. Right. You had uh, the, the, the toughness factor of being a soldier in your BDUs. But then they also would fly you up on an adventure and drop these soldiers on the top of a mountain. But then they'd also set up like a satellite dish. So if you want to learn a trade and get a job. A lot of things to pull people in, right? But I think that a lot of people bought into that. You know, they were really affected by these snappy ads. And so I think that the Pentagon should have one as well. Uh, they ought to have their own sort of cheeky, snappy motto. And I think it should go like this. Uh, the Department of Defense, this is why we can't have nice things. And what do I mean by that? 
childcare, public college, safe and effective infrastructure, healthcare, all of which COVID uh, and the last presidency exposed the tenuousness of our society, our economy, our safety net. And so uh, the Pentagon, right? This is why we can't have nice things, but we can if we actually make change that is systemic and we direct it and take the advice of folks like Brittany who have real solutions and are at least working towards that. So thanks very much for my time, which I'm over by a little bit. Danny, one more question for you, please. Um, just talk a little bit. You, you've adopted the Eisenhower name and, and it's the 60th anniversary of his famous industrial military complex speech here uh, tomorrow. And so tell us a little bit, was Ike right? Yeah, I mean, I think that Eisenhower was disturbingly correct in his warning about the military industrial complex. Uh, I wonder, in fact, if he could have foreseen how far off the rails and through the looking glass we would be now. Um, you know, the Eisenhower Media Network using that name, it's a, it's a controversial and provocative choice. Some people on, on the peace movement say, why would you have uh, a five-star general, right? Why, why would you have that choice? And this is, you know, he was not an imperfect president, just ask a Guatemalan or an Iranian, but uh, his ability to, to diagnose and show that, you know, at one time, this kind of systemic critique could come from even a Republican, even a West Point grad, even a general. So uh, I think it's important. But one of the other things I said, and I'll stop here, uh, he gave another speech at another key transition when Stalin died in 1953, uh, called a chance for peace speech. And that's the one where he said that, hey, listen, every rocket that's fired signifies a theft from, you know, farmers and healthcare workers and infrastructure. And he ended that by saying that under this cloud of threatening war, that's not life in any real sense. That's humanity hanging from a cross of iron. And I would just say that since then, we are way further down the path of the military industrial complex, infusing every aspect of our lives, even ones we might not think that it does. And, uh, and oh, by the way, you know, the strategic consulting wing of said military industrial complex is alive and well in the Biden bunch. We have to keep an eye on it and call it out everywhere.